Hello and welcome to Performance in Context. I'm Jennifer Larson, president of Friends of Chamber Music. We have the very great privilege this week of hosting the Danish String Quartet in a concert in Page Hall, downtown campus, University at Albany on Saturday at 3 p.m. They'll be performing a concert of works by Britain, Mozart, and Nordic fiddle music. It will be fun and wonderful in every way. Tickets are available at friendsofchambermusic.org. I hope you can join us. It's my pleasure, great pleasure to interview Danish string quartet violinist, Runa Tansgaard Sorensen. I'm so happy you can be here with us. I know you've been traveling. Um, you're touring the US at the moment. Yes. Do, you, do you tour the US often? Yes, we do actually. Um, I think this year we will we will be here four times, um, and we are still working on some some bigger projects, um, and also uh, trying to catch up on of some of the um, cancellations uh, during the pandemic. So uh, so it's quite busy over here uh, this year. So you have a backlog. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Yes. <laughs> Oh man, that must be exhausting. <laughs> it's fine. It's it's we like being here, and it it feels like our uh, second home court in a way. So uh, so it's it's nice. Um, yeah. <laughs> so the interviews this year have been about artistic journeys, and mm -hmm. I'm hoping to have a conversation with you about your artistic journey, the things you're thinking about, the things you're exploring. Um, but first, I'd like to start with a little background. What were your early music experiences like as a child in Denmark? Um, yeah, so I grew up actually with folk music first and foremost. And uh, the first instrument I got was actually not a violin. It was a, a tiny little accordion. <laughs> and I got it when I was uh, three years old. Um, and uh, my parents, they um, always loved uh, traditional music. They are not musicians themselves, but they loved the dancing most, mostly. They were singing a lot uh, in, in my childhood home. And uh, they would bring me to all these uh, dance evenings and uh, festivals and get togethers uh, within the folk music environment. Um, the city I grew up in is called Roskilde. And Roskilde was one of the uh, first places to sort of revitalize re traditional music in Denmark back in the 70s and 80s. So it has really been a center of, of folk music in Denmark. And um, that's what I grew up in. Uh, when I was four years old, I uh, got my first violin. I don't know if it was because I didn't like the accordion or, or what the story is there but but I got a, a little tiny little violin um, maybe it was easier to just you know uh, walk and play at the same time because that's sometimes what you do in, in folk music you know there was these big uh, festivals I remember with um, it always started with like a big um, it's called a procession I don't know like when every everyone is walking like just one uh one direction down to a like sort of a place in Roskilde and then play together it was like hundreds of people and um I was always there with my little violin and some other kids in the front you know leading the way um so so the folk music was sort of my introduction to to music basically and um then only later I got to uh play classical music I started with the Suzuki method uh, which is this Japanese um, learning method. Uh, had a Suzuki teacher for five years. Um, and then, you know, since that day, the two genres, types of music has just been living side by side in my life. Um, and uh, I, I love uh, all parts of it. Um, and then you know, I met the guys in the quartet when I was in, uh, I think I was 14 or 15 when I when I met the guys and uh, and that has become my life now. This is what I do. Um, and uh, I think there has been 
from the beginning not so much doubt uh, whether I should be a musician. It, it was quite clear that uh, that was going to be the path uh, of my life. And uh, I feel very privileged now uh, get, getting to play great music with uh, my, my best friends. So, um, yeah. So were you, you were at a, a music camp of sorts when you met the other members? Of yes, yes. It was sort of like a, a classical jam session, you, you can say. Um, it, was a, it was a summer camp in Denmark. Uh, it's every year. It's for amateur musicians. And um, I think it's around like two, three hundred people there playing orchestra during the day and then chamber music uh, in the nights. And then I really mean the whole night was was chamber music. <laughs> you didn't get to sleep much uh, during that week, but it was it was all really, really fantastic. And uh, great thing about uh, amateur musicians is that it is really 100 percent only for for the love of the music. Uh, it's not always sounding super great, but that's not that's not the point. Um, it was the same case with us, you know, uh, when we met at this summer camp, we would just go to the music library, uh, get a pile of standard repertoire and then just find a room and sit down and, and side read as much as we could. And um, uh, we had our favorites. I remember we, we loved the Debussy and the, the Ravel a lot, um, but we were not able, able to play it. <laughs> <laughs> um, only the first line of the Ravel, I, 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 I remember that that sounded pretty OK. And then it got really tricky and then we just skipped parts. But, you know, it was it was just like um, it. There was an inst instant spark of, of chemistry there, both personally and musically. And we really found each other in the music there and um, just sitting down and, and, and playing music for fun was just a great uh, introduction for us to, to the string quartet world. And um, I think we, we sort of built on that uh, since we met, built on the friendship, built on the shared love of, of making music together. And, and that's what, what keeps us going still to this day. Um, because um, music is for me and for us a very social thing it's basically an excuse to uh, <laughs> to meet and and get to play um, and and hang out and travel and see the world and meet wonderful people um, so so um, that's that the string quartet is sort of a vehicle or a vessel of to to get to that um, so yeah uh, it has been a long time now, and then we we celebrate our twenty years uh, anniversary now. Um, so let's see what, where it brings us in the future. Right, I did see that you were celebrating your twentieth. Right, <laughs> that's amazing, amazing, and you're still friends. Yes, that's that's wonderful. <laughs> I, I read I read in one of the interviews of your performances. Uh, they said that you were joyous, and I I. That is a perfect encapsulation of what you've just described to me. Mm -hmm. um, the music for you is joyous, it's communal and social, and I think that's yes, wonderful. it it really is, and and uh, maybe in particular chamber music. Um, I don't think that any of us would would do well as soloists. Uh, <laughs> It would just become too lonely for us. I think we we need each other, and uh, you know the string quartet for us is sort of like a second family. We we talked about that a lot. Um, we get to spend a lot of time together uh, on the road and uh, talk about yeah everything in life, and um, you know being able to 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 do this together and and not being alone on stage but but uh, you know carry each other also in more difficult times maybe is really important for us um so that's 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 the gasoline for us that's for sure <laughs> i read that you were interested in church music and mm -hmm. you played organ um Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's another social application of music. And I'd like to know about that and and if it 
informs what you do as a quartet or in the way you choose your programs or think about music? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the story uh, about that is that um, I was for many years, 10 years, uh, singing in a boys choir in uh, Roskilde Cathedral. And uh, this choir had a very um, charismatic uh, conductor and he encouraged me to uh, to study the organ. I have always been very um, interested in playing the piano. The piano for me was uh, the fun part, whereas the violin, I knew I had to practice. But but uh, since I, I didn't take lessons in piano, this was just more, you know, I I loved going to the piano in my parents' home and just playing for fun, you know, just sitting there and see what I could you know, figure out uh, on the piano. Um, and I think I, it all relates to the um, to, to harmony. I sometimes I, I, I miss uh, being able to do harmony on violin. I mean, of course, we can play a couple of notes at the same time and double stops and all that. But, you know, um, like these full chords is just something that I really enjoy. Um, and then he encouraged me to to study organ, and uh, so uh, so I did. Uh, I entered the uh, church music school in Roskilde back in two thousand, yeah, two thousand. I think it was I started, um, and I wanted to uh, see if I could do it in in two years instead of three years because I had another plan uh, applying for the Academy of Music on the violin, and uh, I did that in the year after. And that meant that I had, you know, both the academy with the violin and the church music school uh, trying to finish up this uh, education on, on the organ at the same time, which was a little bit uh, too much for me. So I actually <laughs> never finished the, the church music education, but I still got to play a lot of organ and I, I practiced my Bach fugues and my chorales. And um, so uh, about you know your question whether it sort of informs the way we we play i think when you play uh, the organ you you really get a sense of of harmony because you you play uh, all these chorales all these hymns and they are often four parts like a string quartet uh, or a choir piece or whatever um and you really get a sense of voicings and music theory also um with harmony and I think that has helped me a lot in the way that uh, I arrange music for the string quartet um, and compose sometimes music for the string quartet. I think um, sort of the, the, the harmonic way of, of thinking harmony is, is, is for sure, um, you know, improved uh, by playing the organ. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, there's just so much wonderful church music. You know, it's it's uh, these pieces for organ are just fantastic. I really love the music, and I love the fact that this is just such a majestic instrument. It's like it's huge. You can you can you can find so many colors, and you feel really powerful uh, when <laughs> playing an organ. I don't know. Um, so. Um, yeah, I, I'm really happy I did it, even though I didn't finish uh, the school. Uh, I think uh, that still it, it it gave me for sure some tools um, in in the future. And now, every time I get the chance, um, I, uh, I I would love to, I play the organ. I mean, if if we go somewhere, this is mainly with my trio, Dreamer Circus. But if we go to a venue with an organ and this, and it's more or less in tune. Um, I, I I usually play it for one or two uh, pieces, so um, yeah, it's 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 nice. <laughs> so here here's a sort of an aside. Uh, when you perform now, do you use an iPad? Do you read from the full score, or do you read your part only? We read our parts only, and I know that many people are reading now from the scores because it's possible you can turn the pages with your feet and and all that, but. I don't know. It's it's um, we have this uh, this <laughs> this great story from the London String Quartet competition, uh, mm -hmm. which is 
14, 15 years ago now. Mm -hmm. And here uh, there was this uh, piece of music that all the quartets needed to perform. It was a piece by uh, Thomas Addis, mm -hmm. um, his first string quartet, Arcadiana. A fantastic piece of music and really difficult, like super tricky. Um, all these polyrhythm, polyrhythms and extended techniques and all that. So we were working and practicing for hours and hours and days. And um, then one day before the competition, uh, we had a flight somewhere and I forgot the score in the plane. And that was, you know, we, that we, we didn't have time to get another score. Mm -hmm. um, so we just needed to work around that. But what it meant was that we actually had to listen a lot for both ourselves, but also for the other parts, like what is going on? You know, and it uh, it meant that we needed to listen even more carefully and using our ears even more carefully uh, as to, you know, what the other people were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and I think sometimes I this is just how we do it, but but uh, there can be a risk in if you have like a visual uh, you know, the score, you can see what all the other people are playing. I, I think there is a risk that you maybe are not listening as carefully. Mm. And that's that's why we actually uh, don't play by scores. We, we, we play our own parts. And um, and of course, we we look at the score sometimes when we when we practice and rehearse, especially with new music, because you need to sort of understand this new language and all that. But but uh, when on stage, it's we only play from our own parts. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I I wonder if you think of yourself as a as a, a musical anthropologist in a way uh, when you're exploring Nordic or you don't just play Nordic fiddle music, by the way, you play other forms of, of traditional music as well, right? Yeah, it's in the quartet. It has been mainly uh, Nordic uh, traditional music, but. Lately, we have expanded a little bit uh, to uh, to to Irish and, and British music. Also, um, we even did a an, an arrangement of an Elvis tune lately. <laughs> I don't know if that uh, qualifies as traditional music, Maybe it does. but um, but it has been mainly uh, Scandinavian and Nordic music because that what we what right. what what we grew up, grew up with. Yeah. So you haven't you haven't branched into bluegrass, for instance? No, not not really yet. <laughs> <laughs> we love it though, and we listen a lot to bluegrass. But yeah. <laughs> well, I was I was looking at your list of fiddle tunes, and it's enormous. And some of them are I don't know, hundreds, maybe close to a thousand years old. And I wonder where you get them. Are you going to archives? Are you doing field recordings or capturing? capturing them somehow uh, when you have old practitioners of folk music that you run across? How, how do you gather them? Yeah, it's it's a combination. It's actually a combination of the things you mentioned, because when, you know, the, tr the traditional folk music has mainly been an oral tradition, you learn by ear, which means that when you did that all your life, you have sort of this bank of tunes in your head. Um, that you, you know, when, when you play at a festival somewhere, there's often these session, jam sessions, uh, busking or whatever. And, and, you know, you have like this common repertoire. Um, you know, there are these evergreens that everyone knows in the environment. Um, so it's, it's a combination of some of our favorite tunes that we learned from a long time ago uh, that we thought, okay, this would sound really amazing for the string quartet. Um, but also, uh, you know, nowadays we, we have access to so much music, so it's quite easy to just go on Spotify and uh, uh, listen to a, a lot of music. And that's what we do a lot. You know, we, we, we see it as a quality to be really open-minded in terms of where we get our inspirations from. Um, so so um, it depends also a little bit. Uh, I mean, the first 
folk music album we did, which is called Woodworks, we didn't think so much about it. You know, we just picked our favorite 13 or 14 tracks and then we arrange them and then we record them and then release. Um, whereas the next uh, album we did last leave, we, I think we tried to put a little bit more thought into the narrative and, you know, of the, um, the travel from the first tune to the last one and trying to think a little bit more in terms of a, of a good album. What is that, you know, and that included maybe a little bit more of, of research in finding the, the right melodies and the right tunes to arrange. Um, and that is also the case now where we, we actually just recorded a new folk album, um, which is probably going to come out later this year. And um, we, uh, we, we started exploring a little bit the, um, the connection between Scandinavian music and the British music, and especially uh, in particular, um, and the music from Ireland, because there is a lot of similarities there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so uh, but this is not maybe our, uh, this is not what we grew up with. So it took a little bit of more research. Um, trying to find the right tune for us to arrange. Um, and that can be a time consuming process. Um, because what it what is it that we want to express and you know what what fits in well uh, together with the other tunes and, and all these things. Uh, there's a lot of thought going into that. But uh, it's, it's a very stimulating process. Um, uh, creatively, it's, 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 uh, it's something that that we gain a lot from, I think. Um, and I think it's just important as a musician to keep your eyes open. Um, you know, in classical music, maybe we have all had a tendency to to focus a lot on our own metier. And, you know, we need to play this Mozart concerto and it needs to be in tune and so we can get a good career and a position in an orchestra and whatever. But I think you know the 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 more inspiration you can get from other genres or from other art forms um the more dynamic of an artist you will be in the end so so we seek a lot of inspiration uh from other people and 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 how they do it um also in terms of performance and concerts and not only albums uh, recordings but but the whole sort of way of thinking music and and what it is that we want to express as a as a group uh, of musicians so um yeah there's we we think a lot about what what it is we want to do and and how we want to do it mm -hmm. when i when i watch recordings of you all play it seems that there are elements of improvisation that make their way into um mm -hmm. your, your arrangements particularly of folk music that maybe maybe of contemporary classical as well. Um, yeah, how, how did you um, become adept at, at improvisation? Was that a part of your early training in fiddle? Um, mm, no, it's, 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 well, you can say in, in a way, uh, in, in, in folk music and traditional music, uh, there has always been a, a, a big part that is you know improvisation and you know when when you say improvisation it can have many forms also it's not always uh, like in jazz it's very common you know have like a section with a solo and you need to you know create a solo uh, uh, on the spot but improvisation can also be like little ornaments or just variations on the melody um, putting a trill here and there, whatever. It's it's very open and it's it's a big part of the folk music. Um, and it means that you sort of take a melody and, and make it your own, uh, give your personal touch to it. Um, and um, this is this is this is very cru crucial in, in 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 the traditional music. Um, so, you know, it's, if, I, I think personally that it should be a bigger part of the education in Denmark. And, and uh, because I, I think it has so many great effects if you are 
um, if you have the courage to to do it, um, because that's what it's often about. You know, you it takes a little bit of 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 courage to to step over that sort of uh, border into the unknown and. Can I, am I able to do this at all? You know, can I improvise? And and uh, there are tools to uh, to become better at, at that, obviously. But the the most important is just to you know jump into into it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's 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 again it's it's uh, it's inspiring to listen how how other people do. Um, and when we perform classical music, you know, we, we, we are playing music that everyone else is playing. You know, we're playing Haydn, we play Mozart, Beethoven, uh, all these things. And um, we, we try to think about what, what uh, we can do to make these great pieces of music uh, our own somehow. And, and what we can do to contribute to an already existing you know, tradition, um, because these pieces have been playing, f- have been played for for uh, centuries. You know, um, and we're all all playing them. It's it feels like uh, we are a cover band sometimes. You know, <laughs> a lot of a lot of cover bands, and and there are a lot of great string quartets out there. So, so I think I think for me at least personally, it's it's a necessity to think about what we can do with these pieces to you know to give a personal um interpretation and and there i think improvisation plays a role um also uh in the performance because we we try to when we practice we uh we always try to create sort of a framework and a strong foundation uh that we can use on stage but then when we are performing a concert we try to be very, very free and and leave a lot of things open uh, for inspiration in the moment and improvisation. Um, so obviously, we practice our with a metronome. We pla- practice our intonation and and s- some uh, details you maybe need to plan a little bit here and there. But uh, but other other. F- other from that, we, we we really try to to keep um, to keep our interpretations open to to new impulses to, uh, at a concert. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, you you need to be comfortable in in improvising. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it keeps the audience at the edge of their seat too, because they don't know exactly what's coming next. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, before we before we leave the this topic of fiddling, uh, I wonder if there are some fiddlers that you think um, our listeners should listen to. Mm. Um, well, some fiddlers, yeah, there, there are probably many. Um, uh, some good names would be uh, Pekka Kusisto. I think he's a wonderful musician. He plays all kinds of music, Finnish uh, violinist, plays a lot of folk music as well. Uh, I, I, I was always very inspired by the French Algerian uh, violinist who actually lives in California now, I think, uh, called Sheila Pap. Also just uh, an amazing musician, uh, super creative mind. Um, in terms of traditional music, um, I don't know. It's it's probably more bands I would recommend. Um, there is there is a wonderful trio in in Scandinavia. It's a Swedish trio called Vasen, V A S E N. They have been playing music for traditional music and their own compositions for uh, you know a lifetime, and and they are really like a, standing as as one of the the most um, uh important uh, bands in the scandinavian folk music tradition um so there are free names at least that uh, i could recommend that's great um i notice when i watch your recordings that you play with a beautiful lift and a lightness and and 
you're not afraid to experiment with the um, lower dynamic levels. Um, not that you can't reach all the extremes. Um, I wonder if you might talk about specific techniques that uh, you uh, that maybe you have brought to uh, classical music from from the fiddle genre. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, that's 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 hard to say. Um, obviously, in classical music, there is there's a lot of dance music. You know. Um, the whole baroque era you know it was it was all about uh, dance suites and all these things you know a great example of course the back uh, suites for for solo violin and solo cello uh, there's all these dances um but also when you go to the to the vienna school and mozart and haydn there's you know tons of minuets all the time for instance and um there, I, I I think that that uh, the folk music sometimes can can give a perspective uh, when playing music that is sort of dance music, mm -hmm. because um, what's what's really important in the folk music is is obviously obviously having a good and steady groove, um, even though we play folk music as concert music, we are not playing for dancers. Uh, it's still, I think, in, important to uh, to keep that in mind, you know, that that it is music uh, for dance. Um, so there's something about the swing and and the groove uh, that that is that is fun also to work with in, in the classical pieces. Um, but apart from that, I think personally, I I approach folk music and classical music the same way um, because folk music has gone from being like serving a, a function for instance at a dance or in a church or you know community house or whatever sing together to being concert music and that is also what we do you know we we take the folk music onto the concert stage and we play the the tunes and uh, the arrangements um for a, a, an audience that are they are sitting down, they are listening carefully. You know, uh, they paid for their tickets. You know, and and um, uh, so it's it's maybe not so interesting for us at least to uh, to do to play the music as you would do traditionally, uh, which is just like playing a tune ten times through uh, for the dancers. You know, we need to you know, figure out what, what the soul of this particular melody is and how we can arrange it in order to create uh, the right narrative, the right uh, emotions, you know. Um, so, so, um, and that's also, you know, we work a lot with colors and sound production and, you know, in, in the folk music as well as we do in, in classical music. So, uh, as long as you have a, a good groove and a good swing, I think um, I think we we try to approach uh, the music the the same way. Um, so the difference there is not maybe so big. Mm -hmm. And you can also say that you know there's a lot of classical composers who used folk music as an inspiration. Uh, you know all of them. You know Brahms, Bartok, uh, you name it. They they all used folk music as a source of inspiration in their, you know, art, music, or what do you want to call it? So, so it's nothing new. Um, yeah, we just take up that tradition a little bit. Mm -hmm. What are you, what are you exploring now? What's most of interest to you at the moment? Are you listening to certain things? Or do you have some ideas on the horizon you're, you're, you're cogitating upon? Yeah, well, um <laughs> i i it's um yes of of course we 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 have and uh i think the general tendency in our group is that we we we're always trying to find that balance between playing the mainstream repertoire which is important and which is wonderful and is mainstream for a reason 
Uh, I mean, we have tons of great music by all the big composers. We are very fortunate as a string quartet to, uh, to, to have so much wonderful music to play. Uh, but we also played a lot of it. Uh, we've been through uh, a lot of, of the classics. Um, we've done our Beethoven cycle. We, uh, we did a lot of Shostakovich. We did a lot of Haydn, Mozart, all these things. Um, so we are also trying to ask ourselves the question, what, what is it that is important to us? And, and um, it's not always that we agree on everything. Um, and uh, that's also the beauty uh, of, of being four indiv individuals together, uh, trying to find sort of a direction in, in, in which to go. Um, and that's this balance we are we're trying to, to find. Um, to me personally, uh, I'm very interested in the things that has not been done before. Uh, you know, Take for instance the folk music. I mean, we this is it feels like a little bit our own music, even though we play a lot of traditional tunes, but it's still our own arrangements and and there are not many other string quartets out there who plays this music. Um and it's fun because you can see also in in the people at our concerts, it's it's a very mixed audience uh, often. And we 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 hear sometimes that oh, this was not the, the audience that, that we normally get here at our society or whatever. Mm -hmm. And this, that's a, the biggest compliment, I think, for us that, that we could, could get. And uh, if people are applauding after the first movement, you know, it's just like, yes, you know, then, then we know that <laughs> we attracted some people who are maybe not used to going to a classical concert. Um, and that's maybe, I don't know, maybe they watch the, our Tiny Desk concert where we only play folk music, where we only play tunes. Um, so so um, what I'm trying to say here is I think if, if for me, I, I like the things that, um, that are not done before and, and that sort of is unexplored land for string quartet because we can we can really play a lot of different music you know uh all the options are are just there and you just need to to figure out what to do with it and 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 uh what it is that you want to express mm -hmm. um so we keep thinking of new projects uh we right now we have a big uh, commissioning project called doppelganger um we commissioned four new pieces uh two female two male composers um and we are in the middle of that right now uh, we're getting a new piece of music here in a week i think by icelandic composer anna torvalsdottir and it's going to be really exciting to uh, to to play that see what it is um and yeah so um commissioning is also a thing that that we uh, that we like mm -hmm. yeah um we had a question from Sarah Saplin, who is on the board of directors for Friends of Chamber Music, she wrote that she had read a New York Times article about the Danish String Quartet in 2016, and it talked about your fondness for beer and talked about a, a festival that you, a concert series in Copenhagen that has its own line of craft beer. Um, she wondered how this came about and uh, how your audiences enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah, it's still, going, it's still going on too, right? You're, you're yes, awesome. yes, yeah, yeah. So it's a concert series that that we curate um, called Series of Four in Copenhagen. Um, yeah, I, I think it it just came about because I, I have a very good friend. Um, who uh, makes beer <laughs> and and uh, he's one of the owners of a brewery in Copenhagen called Frederiksberg Brøkhus and um, they, they you know they're quite small brewery but they uh, they make some great beer and um, I don't remember exactly how it came about but uh, I think I just asked him you know whether they would uh, be willing to to uh, to make a beer for a concert series and uh, he was like, yeah, sure, 
sure, sure thing. <laughs> um, why not? And then we had these sessions where we were trying out, you know, different recipes and um, it shouldn't be something that it was too experimental. Uh, so all the sour beers were maybe a little bit too crazy for, for some of our audiences. So we, uh, we settled on a sort of a more or less traditional Pilsner uh, recipe, but like a hoppy Pilsner, it was, it's, it's really good actually, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and then we had like labels made and, and all these things. Um, and, you know, the, the place we do the concerts is, is the Academy of Music in Copenhagen. They, they have this beautiful concert hall and, and they were only serving like standard Carlsberg. And, you know, it, it didn't really resonate with the, you know, the quality that we wanted to have uh, for the whole concert series, like great artists coming there. And, you know, you know, there was something that, that didn't really fit really well with like a, a a bad you know commercial beer there i don't know so so we wanted to create our own and um yeah then then it was suddenly in the new york times and <laughs> I, guess, <laughs> I guess just the pr value there was uh was enough to uh, justify that decision of making the beer <laughs> but it is a good beer i i, I must say <laughs> Oh goodness! Well, on on that note, we'll we'll draw we'll draw the interview to a close. I really hope you all can come and see the Danish String Quartet in action. I had been hoping to book you for three years. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I finally have, we're here. It's gonna be great. Finally, you're here, <laughs> and I just couldn't be more pleased. Thank you so much for for joining me and. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person on Saturday. And between now and then, I will try to scamper around and find some good local beer for you to try. <laughs> so, oh, that sounds amazing. Thank you. And there <laughs> we is, will appreciate there is that a, a lot. There are <laughs> some wonderful microbreweries in the region. And I think I think I can come up with something. So thank you so much, Runa. Great. And I'll see you on Saturday. Thank you. I'm, and thank you yeah, all who wonderful. joined us.